Hi and welcome. It's so great to see you all again and uh, I'm really thrilled to be here with Patricia Walsh who is an amazing para-athlete, uh, world champion and um, I'm going to ask Patricia to say a little bit of her, um, you know, of your, your story because it's pretty incredible. She wrote this amazing book called Blind Ambition and uh, you lost your sight when you were very young but what I was struck from the very moment that I met you was how you are a stand for always having seen yourself as an able-bodied person and how often that is missing for people. People are so much, we're all so much more capable, but especially, you know, if people have something going on, it's how the perception mm -hmm. is often limiting. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'd love to just kind of... Uh, hear a little bit about, you know, your, how you see yourself and what brought you to become a para-athlete. I mean, that's pretty phenomenal oh, at this level. Thank you. Yes. And, and thank you for having me. And it's been wonderful to work with Wendy and wonderful to be here at uh, Pilates uh, Center of Austin. So my story, I uh, lost my vision in 1986. I had a pediatric brain tumor, and uh, I used to specify that it's a severe brain tumor, and I realized there is no such thing as a brain tumor that's not severe, so <laughs> there's no easy case, right? right? So um, I lost my vision pretty suddenly. It was, of course, unexpected, and um, I think the general posturing around me after that was to treat me as someone who was very fragile. Uh, but I didn't feel any different, and uh, I wanted to be as capable and uh, certainly as active as all the other kids. And anyone who knows me knows that if you want to, you want to get me to do something daredevil, all you have to do is suggest it even <laughs> once, <laughs> and I'm in. <laughs> and you can consider that it's happening now. But with everyone trying to protect me, with the you know their intent was to, um, was to. Uh, create a safe environment for me, but what I felt was that I was being limited and that I wasn't able to pursue my own aptitudes. And, uh, you know, with the other kid, we'd go to gym and the other kids would play and they'd have me on the sidelines stacking blocks like a toddler. And I was so frustrated to, um, not only to not be included, but to not be able to pursue my own aptitudes. And I think I had a sense that I could have been an athlete given the opportunity. And you to just say something just a second? Sure. Because you're going to love reading this, but there's so many specific, really special stories. And I love, I think it's so powerful how you taught yourself to run track. Yeah, absolutely. It was phenomenal. So I always had a sense that I could do more. So the story that Wendy's speaking to is, uh, you know, when I realized that uh, my dad, my grandmother were having health problems. I was in college at the time and they were having a lot of heart issues. And I kind of realized that because I had you know, uh, started to believe I wasn't capable, that I wasn't pursuing athletics. And um, what I started to do was running uh, at a trail near my house, and I had no real plan, but I knew that if I ran with my foot on the edge, I would either go too far, and then I'd feel gravel, or too far the other way, and I'd feel concrete on both. So I kind of uh, rolled my ankles all the time, but I learned to run by just running on the edge pretty dangerously. My first time out, I didn't know how to get back. My second time out, I had put a rock down, so when I was on my back, I'd hit the rock and fall. And that was the whole, that was the whole process working. That's the system working. Um, but what I, speak, <laughs> what I speak to in my book is, you know, I stopped pursuing athletics in my, my youth and in my high school years because I had been given the message that I wasn't capable. So what I speak to in my book is that there is some universal truth and that, that we're all limited by what we believe we're capable of doing. There are lots of people in our lives who, who have good intentions and who have love and kindness and want to protect us, but may actually be inhibiting us from pursuing you know, our true aptitudes and the things that we uh, really care about and, and want, to, um, want to aspire. You know, think of an example of someone you know who's doing a, you know, a business administration degree when what they truly want to do is culinary arts, you know, and they have this aptitude, but they're being taught that that's too risky to do this instead. And I think that happens to a lot of people a mm -hmm. lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So I started to pursue my own athletics, really with no intent of becoming a career athlete. Um, I went from doing little runs around my neighborhood that you know were scary, but we got through it. Uh, started to kind of learn what tools and, and what support was available to me. Um, eventually ran 12 marathons, uh, qualified for Boston Marathon, not by the visually impaired standard, but by the able-bodied standard. Uh, went on to run an ultra marathon, which is 35 miles, and then from there, um, based on a dare from my friend, 
Uh, I did my first Ironman, where I was the first blind female to have ever completed an Ironman distance. Um, Ten months later, I actually broke the world record for fastest uh, blind and low vision athlete, um, and I beat the male record by 55 minutes, so I'm actually the fastest. Unbelievable. Not, thanks. <laughs> Since then, um, I've been the USA Athlete of the Year in 2012. I am a five-time U.S. national champion. I am currently ranked second in the world in both uh, world ranking and Paralympic ranking. And I have uh, two continental gold championships and uh, three international triathlon union bronze medals. So thank you. Phenomenal. And currently my goal, which Wendy's helping me with, is very, uh, my goal is I've recently qualified for the 2016 Paralympics. Um, so with Winnie helping me learn how to better use gravity and how to work smarter and not harder, um, you know, really hope to bring home gold, mm. uh, which she's done before for mm. other Olympic athletes. So I'm really thrilled to be here and, mm. and feel like it's going to be a huge, um, huge movement to propel my career forward. So I'm thrilled. Fabulous. Yeah. Fabulous. And plus we have a lot of fun together. We have a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy gets my jokes. Yeah. <laughs> My dorky joke. Yeah, so let's <laughs> let's show. I mean, one of the things that you said was uh, you're familiar with the with the sense of uh, tensegrity, and mm -hmm. say a little something about what this means to you, because you know it's really important to be able to visualize what how to not just use your hard abdominals hardening. Mm -hmm. How what's the difference between really feeling your whole body moving, sure, supported, and isolating a body part. Yeah, so this, you know, when Wendy showed me this really great tactile diagram, you know, with these kind of harder pieces representing our bone structure and these uh, more elastic pieces representing our soft tissue, it really made it very clear to me that if we're not working with our soft tissue, um, not only are our bones not moving to, to their um, ability, to their mm -hmm. full range of motion, but we're also, if we're not... Uh, you know, really working with the flexibility and the strengthening of the soft tissues, we're setting ourselves up for injury. And uh, I recently, I was telling Wendy, I, I recently recovered from some stress fractures because what I was doing was forcing my body to run in this really unnatural way. Well, using this tensegrity, you can feel how much pressure is putting on your bones when you're trying to force your body out of alignment or you're trying to fight gravity rather than work with gravity and work the way the body's meant to, to, uh, to operate. So I was telling Wendy, mm -hmm. it's kind of it's very hard to run out of out of your natural position, but if you work really hard at it, <laughs> you can do anything wrong, mm -hmm. you know. So, but you can just feel the tremendous amount of pressure that's put on these tiny bones that are not meant to have that elasticity or that pressure, and that's where you're going to get injury. So I'm really here, you know, really glad to be here to do some injury prevention for the next year. Yeah, stay injury yeah. free. Beautiful. So let's show everybody what we did um, to begin. Remember when you first. Even as a, as a top athlete, an elite athlete, I mean, you know the bridge. You've done it a million times. I do bridges every day. Right. Yeah. But you hadn't realized no. you weren't really in your feet. You yeah. were really using your back and your glutes too much. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I was using the bridge to force my body out of alignment. And now we're working to correct those things so I can, you know, really leverage the balance in the body to make the bridge natural. So from an athletic perspective, what this means to me is I'll get the same amount of, of movement with less energy expenditure, right? So if you do like cost benefit, you actually are saving more energy to be propelling yourself forward rather than just fighting your body. Brilliant, brilliant. Which is just wasteful. Exactly. So go ahead and lie down on your back. Sure. And, right, first of all, so show a little something about how when you first did your bridge, how you were like popping your ribs a little bit more. Sure, that's right. Lifting your back. So when I was first doing my bridge, I had a kind of a huge arch in the spine, which is not natural, popping the ribs up. And then when I would actually do the bridge, I was looking at it only as an upper glute movement and just really forcing it and almost forcing the hips up out of alignment. Now, now that I know better what I feel when I do this, I feel a huge amount of pressure in the hip flexors that's unnatural. I feel pressure on my back that's unnatural. And I feel my kind of rib cage and abdominals uh, tightening in a way that restricts breath, not tightening in a way that is actually going to improve strength. So now that I know the difference, I can see that that's not, that's working harder, but it's not going to help you. Yeah. Yeah. Gorgeous. So now show how you're sequencing from your feet and then I'll come up and we'll show how we can add more support for upper core yeah. in the hands. Okay. But first of all, show it from the lower core, how you'd feel your feet yeah. and how you're just curling 
So when we started this, we, we think of a weight shift. So you're just weight shifting the pelvis more to the back, so it's more of a natural movement. And the idea here that Wendy's teaching me is not to move from the hips, but actually move from the hip suspension, which is right here. So I think of it, a big kind of learning point for me was to think of my abdominals moving up, not tightening like we've always thought of. So when I do the bridge now, I think of, of really initiating the movement by moving the abdominals up, and feeling feet and to feeling curl the feet that. Balance. There you go. And one other huge learning point for me was Wendy has taught me that the um, the hamstrings are you know are extending at the same time as your abdominals. So they're working together as a counterbalance. Yes. So rather than each of them kind of fighting each other, if you think of that as being a system, right? Beautiful. It's m much more effective. Yeah. And plus, you can really see a huge difference in your throat too, Patricia. Yeah, you know. I don't feel an, a, I don't feel inhibited in my chest. I don't feel like my uh, I can sit here and talk to you all day. You know, I don't feel like my lungs are restricted. I don't feel like I've got that pressure in my hips. It's just a very natural movement. It's just a matter of you know, Wendy's telling me to keep my um, my feet engaged with my sit bones, so you are able to. And see how Just in weight shifting, have the same amount of movement, but without the cost of the energy expenditure. That's beautiful, beautiful. So you can see how Patricia's releasing her ribs down, which is allowing the, her hamstrings, the inner ankle, inner thigh, internal lift along the front of the spine to the inner ear to support the lift. So then you're in your feet yeah, to create your bridge. Now, so here's another way you can do a partner support for it, where... She was originally doing it now from the, uh, from just the lower core. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to engage the upper core also, what we call the upper core, hands mm -hmm. and head to the feet. So now you just straighten your arms and tell me when you're, when my weight. See, what she's looking for is, is to tell, she's in charge. Mm -hmm. Client is in charge. The client is the expert in biointelligence. So now you're going to tell me when is that a good place for me to be that's a very good yeah that feels good so, so i feel the grounding ground grounding good. in my shoulder blades right there great okay. so now your shoulder blades are grounded your feet are grounded mm -hmm. and that allows your spine to float absolutely and i feel my neck kind of opening up without any movement it mm -hmm. just feels less pressure on the neck and now i can do the weight shift uh of the pelvis that lifts the body so i feel grounded in my feet i feel like my feet and my sit bones are connected and I just do the weight shift and lift up. Beautiful. And down. And it just it feels like a very natural, very healthy movement. Yes. And it's interesting that I can feel more connection from hands to your feet and my feet. Oh, wow. So it's like we become more of a connected unit also. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not me doing something to you. Mm -hmm. There's a way that we are, we're doing the tensegrity movement again. Absolutely. We're becoming Absolutely. more connected through tensegrity. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, yes. Love it. Beautiful. Now, Patricia will stay in that position, and let's say you don't have a partner. Mm -hmm. So another way that we explored it is if, let's imagine that this is a two-pound weight or a three-pound weight, mm -hmm. and that would be the person. Mm -hmm. So you're just holding the weight, which gives that feeling of waterfall down the back, holding a weight and releasing down. And you can play with the weight. Like, for instance, if she took her arms above her head... You see, you still have the weight as you lift up, and then you're relaxing. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. See how you're playing with that feeling of weight shift. Mm -hmm. Arms, where your arms go. Your arms can go to the side. Your arms can go above your head. And it's really deepening that core coordination throughout your whole body. Yeah, it's really... It, you do, you notice that the connection of your diaphragm with your arm movement uh, in a way that I had never realized before in... Uh, Really, you notice how um, as your weight shifts, how it's connected to everything in your body with similar to that tensegrity uh, uh, model that was shown. Mm. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you. So much. Thank you. It's such a pleasure. Yeah, I love, I'm very excited about this work and, uh, you know, excited for all your instructors also. Thank so, you. Yeah, thank thanks. you. Fabulous to see you all be together. Talk to you soon.